I don't know what I was expecting. You know, after George Floyd got murdered on camera, after a summer full of protests, the likes of which we haven't seen in a generation, not just in Detroit and Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, but in Livonia and Saline and Howell, Howell, Michigan of all places, and in communities large and small, urban and rural, across this country and beyond. I don't know what I thought would happen. You know, I mean, intellectually, I understood that uh, our criminal justice system is barnacled and baked in with all kinds of resistance to any kind of change. A culture and a set of laws and lobbies, unions. But you know, some part of my like, some part of my brain, some like toddler magical thinking piece of me like thought and believed, you know, that at least, at least the optics would reduce this parade of black people killed by police, you know? At least it would slow down. How, how naive, how white of me. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, you know, but, 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 but it wasn't, it wasn't another young person. It wasn't Toledo in uh, Chicago or Dante, right? And look, I mean, it, it, you know, this is the third Sunday of Easter and I, I really don't mean to be a downer as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, but I just feel like I've been dropped into like a horror movie reboot of Groundhog Day, you know? It could be anything too. It could be the mass shootings that are going on. It could be Jim Crow voter suppression yet again. And, but you know, it's Groundhog Day, but instead of responding to the, to the events in a better and better way as Bill Murray does in that movie, the opposite's happening to me and to us. It's like nationally we engage in a ritual that feels increasingly hollow. And I've kind of run out of like outrage, run out of anguish, run out of hope. I preached some great sermons, you know, after Sandy Hook and after Ferguson. I've run out of things to say. Whether it's mass shootings or voter suppression or just yet another black life snuffed out by the state. You know, one, one little piece of that story that really grabbed me, I just keep chewing on it. I don't know if you noticed this or, or heard this, but it turns out that George Floyd's girlfriend was one of Dante Wright's teachers in public school. The shooting that happened about 10 miles away from the trial of Floyd's murderer. And here's this, his girlfriend was Dante's teacher. And you know that, that, that young Lieutenant in the army, uh, Nazario, I don't know if you saw that video from December who got pepper, uh, pepper sprayed by those white cops. He has some kind of family connection to Eric Garner. And so, you know, I, I, I hear those details and I think this, you know, this is a community. This is, this, is a, this is a group of folks who know each other. And what must it feel like to be targeted as a community like that? You know, it's not just another person of color. It's, oh, I know that person. That person could be me. And, you know, for what? For having an air freshener hanging from your rear view mirror? 
from not yet having new plates, even though your, you know, your dealer plates are right in the window. I mean, it's crazy. I think Trevor Noah said, said one thing about this that, that, that really I think is true. And he said, you know, where are the good, we keep hearing that there are bad apples, you know, bad apples in these departments that are doing these things. Where are the good apples? Not, and I wanna underline this, not that there aren't good people in law enforcement. There are amazing people who do a job extremely hard to do. Not that there aren't good people in law enforcement. That's not what he was saying. He was clear about that. The question he had was, where are the good apples who actually stop the bad apples? Where are the cops who step in and prevent the bad cop from kneeling on the man's neck until he dies? Or from pepper spraying a completely docile and respectful army lieutenant? And his conclusion, which I think is right on, is that those good apples are there, but they're not taking those actions because they know that those actions would pit them against an entire system. And the system is bigger than any individual. The problem is not good apples, bad apples. The whole tree is rotten. In our sacred ground, we are reading Howard Thurman, one of the most amazing theologians of the 20th century. This is his book, Jesus and the Disinherited. He was deeply committed to nonviolence and uh, had a huge influence on the civil rights movement. And here's a passage from the chapter we just read. He writes, in a society in which certain people or groups by virtue of economic, social, or political power have dead weight advantages over others who are essentially without that kind of power, those who are thus disadvantaged know that they cannot fight back effectively, that they cannot protect themselves, that they cannot demand protection from their persecutors any slight conflict, any alleged insult, any vague whim, any unrelated frustration may bring down upon the head of the defenseless the full weight of naked physical violence, even in such circumstance, even in such circumstance, it is not the fear of death that is most often at work. It is the deep humiliation arising from dying without benefit of cause or purpose. A little bit later, he writes, there are few things more devastating than to have it burned into you that you do not count and that no provisions are made for the literal protection of your person. Thurman wrote that in 1949. He might as well have written it 72 two years later. And he's really writing about the use of fear and violence as a mechanism of oppression of poor people and of people of color. So I don't know how to preach resurrection in the face of this. Everything I think of saying just feels insufficient. The only thing I can really offer is that to be targeted by the state and to have your life treated as if it were nothing by the powers and principalities is the experience that Jesus entered into when he died. And his resurrection, as small as this may sometimes seem, his resurrection tells us that those lives that are treated as nothing are not nothing. They matter. God cares about them. Amen. <laughs>